Um, I'm Nancy Marin. I'm from Ithaca SNR in New York. We are a strategy and research group. Our sister companies are JSTOR and Portico. And our group is a, you know, the research and cons consulting and soon to be training group that sits next to them. Um, we've been focusing on questions that have to do with the intersection of technology and higher education. And um, the group that I work with in particular has been zeroing in on the question of sustainability of digital content for a few years now. Um, my colleagues tend to focus sometimes on a specific audience. One really zeroes in on libraries, another really zeroes in on questions around faculty. And, and the fact is, um, my audience is kind of anyone who's ever tangled with sustainability questions around digital content. So we know that's a, it's a very wide range. We've had um, some studies that we've done that zero in on what a project leader does when they get grant funded and have to come up with their own plan. Um, and we've, we've heard from some folks with projects like that here today. We focused on what funders do and how they think about funding strategies on, on a bigger scale in terms of policy decisions. And uh, we've also looked at institutional strategies, and that's something that we're looking at now. Um, I'm really thrilled to be looking right now, and especially today, at what the intersection of those questions are specifically with the publishing function. Uh, in an earlier career, I was in publishing in various roles. And so to see how this kind of starts to line up and to see how this is really coming to overlap quite nicely in the library world has been very exciting. So the talk today, you'll see, isn't about one specific project. It's actually the fruits of a lot of the studies we've done in the, in the last several years and trying to put together uh, something useful, something we hope you will find useful in terms of thinking about the sets of challenges that I imagine many of you may be facing now. So to start, how about this for an obvious sentence? Con you know, content is everywhere, and digital content is really everywhere, and moving online extremely rapidly. What gets really exciting, though, is not just the, the journals and the books, and that we have seen already make the transition. Um, although it's interesting still is questions of institutional repositories, again, are very active, uh, very active issues. But what's really, really interesting are those categories of content that never really had a formal distribution method. So thinking about things like special collections, born digital content, any faculty-based projects that kind of get done in an academic department somewhere. These can be very specific and sometimes kind of quirky projects, uh, but they are not insignificant. And in any given year, you know, federal and private funders are spending a tremendous amount still helping us to create these all around uh, higher ed campuses in this country and around the world. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'd like to focus on what it looks like to think about the places where libraries actually are already publishers. And you'll see, I'm gonna use that word maybe a little bit loosely, or maybe a little with my arms a little wide, but maybe not publishers yet of um, peer-reviewed scholarly content, but in terms of folks who are creating content where um, they are the, the creator and the, and the hoster and all those other things. So unlike data sets, for example, these collections um, of primary source content, um, they could have a shot at a wider audience, as, as uh, Kathleen was telling us this morning, this idea of wider publics. But unlike books and journals, there really aren't any fixed answers yet about how and what that distribution method is gonna look like and how that material finds its way to readers. So thinking about how we can um, benefit from some examples out there is what we'll be doing today. We know actually the extent to which um, libraries, in particular ARLs, are already in this world. So earlier this year, ARL and Ithaca conducted a survey of digitized special collections. And this is available on our website and on theirs, but just for some kind of high-level findings, first, everyone who participated, and we had, a, I think, about a 70% response rate, was doing some kind of digital content creation. And anyone who said they were doing it was doing it at least in part based on their own collection of rare and unique materials. About half were also going farther afield and dealing with things that were maybe faculty creations or born digital efforts. Um, and about 70% reported that uh, the digitized special collections were considered a real priority, although that wasn't to say that the path going forward was an obvious or easy one. So uh, online, I'm gonna zap right around, online content has really shifted the library's role quite a bit from acquiring the idea that you can acquire content and share it locally to this idea where you know, if it's your content, if it's original and you're the first one to actually ever put it online, 
you know, you have the potential to be actually the publisher, uh, create ways to share it widely in ways that are pretty much potentially worldwide. Now, how will people find out that you have it? Um, discovery services are starting to develop. There are interesting things happening with Dipla, and they may have a very big role in this. But, but for the time being, the library that creates these collections and puts them online is the first line of sharing. So in terms of expanding this footprint, this could be a great opportunity. Um, it could be a great opportunity. It could expand things to international audiences. We know that that's a possibility. We know that it could simply increase the numbers and the potential impact. But um, it also comes with uh, possible trade-offs and challenges. Certainly there are new activities that may need to take place. And these activities may come with some costs. So how are we going to get there? Sorry, I'm going to flip us back where I should have been. So what is going to make this content sustainable? And what I would say is that that really depends on how we define sustainability. So that word has been mentioned a few times already today. And I'm going to lay out maybe a slightly different definition from what we've heard before. And you'll tell me what you think. We'll have questions at the end. Um, you know, first, we have to assume that the thing you're talking about is something everyone agrees we want to sustain. For whatever your criteria is, it's not a pure experiment. It's not some interesting idea that we'll try it once and see how it goes. It's, it's a collection of content. It's something that has some weight to it that has been decided is, is worth investing in. What are the things that I need to do to keep it ongoing, valuable, accessible, and important to those who care most about it? So then how will I do this? Um, and you know, let's not even talk about money. I didn't even say the, the M word. <laughs> we won't even talk about financial sustainability. Um, just what are the activities that might need to happen for the long term to keep the content valuable? So he, this is just a couple of wild guesses, but I'm sure you may agree. Some things are going to be technical questions around storage and hosting, around preservation, around access. But there may be other things too. It may turn out for, that, for this collection to be valuable, there's new content that is uh, being created in that discipline or on that topic that really should live with the content that's been already created. And how does that come in? There might be things to update. Uh, the audience. <coughs> the goal for making it sustainable may be that we feel like there's a, more people out there who need to know about it. How do we keep them engaged and, uh, and using it and finding it useful? And then, my favorite slide of the day, too, is the, 50, is the 52, was it 52 or 56 different methods of impact. The last category is anything that you think is important or anything that your users tell you is important. And how are you going to keep that thing working? So only after those fundamental issues concerning impact have been resolved, you know, what do we want this to achieve and what activities do we need to be doing, then can you start to ask about how those activities can be supported. And note, we're still not talking about money yet. So sustainability is a system. Um, you know, it's not just going to be preservation and access. It's not just going to be the, the, pre the exploitation of content for profit or something like that or ways to make money. I, I suggest that we should start to think about it. I mean, maybe many of you have already as a real unified system. It's a way of thinking about how can we create and deliver something of value to an audience, and then in what way can that audience actually be helping us to continue this? And it's the forms that that value and coming back from your users can take where things start to get very interesting. So th the sustainable model um, is about the activities, it's about the network of support, and what it really isn't is just, look at this great thing, <laughs> can I attach a, a revenue model to it in some way? It's a bit more complex than that. I'd like to suggest, I'm sorry, I think the slides are in funny order today, um, that when it comes to thinking about making content open, and here's where the sustainability question and the open question start to intersect a bit. Um, rather than just thinking about open as a goal, I'm going to suggest that we should even look beyond that, beyond open, better than open, aiming for impact. And I was so pleased to hear, I think this has been a big theme of the day. Um, at least I'm on the right path here, right? Um, you know, by itself, open is really just a starting point. It's not a distribution strategy, it's not a business model, it's nothing else. You know, the joke being, it's the equivalent of being an actual old-fashioned publisher, creating a fantastic new book, and printing them, putting them in the warehouse on a pallet, and just putting up a sign saying, free, take one. 
You know, creating it in the first place is a, is a starting point and an exciting starting point, but what, cup in, what happens next is what's important. So what we're gonna look at next, and again, I apologize, but I'm gonna try to do this in the order I meant to, is to think about some snippets of ideas that we have been following through the case study work we've done in the past and through a current piece of case study work we're doing now where we've had a chance to see some very interesting examples of tactics for working with content um, in ways that we feel encourage sustainability and by doing a set of activities that may look more familiar to traditional publishers than they normally would to, um, to others who haven't uh, thought about these in terms of the business questions. So it's a bit of a hodgepodge, but we're hoping you'll find this useful. So for example, the content question. Um, when we think about digitized special collections and primary source collections, for example, what we've tended to hear, what we, we have heard in the research we've done, was what it means to kind of scoop up a bunch of content and say, this is the collection that we have and we will digitize it. What we think is an interesting thing that we st we're starting to see happening is the extent to which there's an editorial shaping that starts to take place. Um, in the case of Hearth, which is a project out of the Cornell Libraries, the Mann Library at Cornell, rather than just say, here's a collection, let's digitize, there was an editorial logic put around this where content was brought in from several other partner institutions because there was a logic that if we do this, it will make sense as a collection and users will like it. Similarly, we've heard from others, and uh, I noticed a paper from a few years back where Don Waters actually signaled out the notion of scholarly editions where again, the logic is where is the best information about this topic? It may not be in one place. There may be an argument for having uh, more uh, partners to participate. Um, we heard that interesting word design earlier today when, uh, when David mentioned his project. And in fact, in looking at a little bit of what goes on on the cultural heritage side, um, the logic that there might be more to invest in um, the work that, in, that engages people visually when they come and visit a site or a collection um, you know, is something we're thinking about. Um, you know, discovery can get you so far, but once people are there, what is it that really brings them in? And here we've seen a lot of activity that has to do with, uh, with visual engagement. Uh, the two examples here are from museums, but there are certainly library examples as well. And finally, my, my favorite subject of all, um, has to do with audience, and this gets us right back to impact and right back to um, other questions, including the other M word that David mentioned, which is marketing. Um, you know, if there's an audience, who is this audience, and how are we finding out about it? The study of ARLs that we did earlier this year had some really, really fascinating findings. Um, on one hand, we understand just how deeply librarians understand the students and the faculty that are using their materials uh, on the campus. But we also started to get a sense that there might be less information being mined and, and analyzed about what's going on online. Um, you know, there are reasons not to want to have people register on websites, and that's obvious, but there's a, there, I wonder how, what other ways might be to start to maybe understand or research what the questions might be and what the actual audiences might be that exist outside of the campus community. And that gets us back to that footprint question. It can be a big opportunity, it can be a risk. It could be that there are projects where you're taking on the weight of the world because now all of a sudden you have users, half of whom are, are outside of what you imagine it is your purview to, to cater for. Um, but without knowing, it becomes hard to deal with. The example I'm putting up here is, is eBird, which uh, I don't know if, if you are familiar with it, but it's, it's something that we studied a few years ago. It's a citizen science project at the Lab of Ornithology, also actually at Cornell, um, that has such an interesting, has had such an interesting uh, success story because it began as an academic project that um, was really meant for ornithologists and meant as a way to grab a whole lot of data from op birding observations for scientific use. The interesting part of the story is that it didn't actually take off until the project team, which was where they brought in actual people from the birding world, realized that rather than as a task, uh, providing data for ornithologists wasn't really exciting the bird watchers, uh, creating lists and checklists of the birds they observe, had observed was actually perfectly exciting to them. So they redesigned, they came up with a set of tools, and, and the project has been wildly successful um, with millions of birding observations logging every, every month. So, you know, the lesson here is 
some research to understand what's going on in the community and then shifting from a logic of let's just put it up and see what happens to seeing how engaging with the user community might lead to some of those, those ideas. Now maybe we will talk a little bit about funding. <laughs> um, when we interviewed um, and uh, surveyed uh, ARL libraries, we noticed um, that a huge number, I think this was close 58, 60% um, listed that financial concerns were among their greatest sustainability concerns. And so that's, that certainly got our attention. So how, you know, how do we pay for this? Um, we noticed that when it came to funding a lot of the activity, this is kind of a funny chart, but um, there was a significant amount of investment and the dark bars indicate how much libraries reported spending and this is just to give you a relative sense. I wouldn't scrutinize these actual numbers. But trust me on this. The dark numbers are, this is how much we're spending to create something new. And the lighter bars next to them signify, this is how much across our entire collection of everything we've digitized already, we are spending to, to maintain that once the creation has taken place. So again, very broad brush, but the takeaway here is simply that um, we wonder if, the creation it may not be enough, and the set of activities that's being invested in, which in theory could include things like further editorial work, marketing work, outreach work, and, and, uh, and support, um, are areas for further investment. Now, the other thing we heard when we did the survey was there was a tremendous resistance to any kind of revenue generation. And we heard all kinds of fascinating questions, answers to us and, and comments to us about, we can't do this, it is not consistent with our mission. Um, which we are, I was very sensitive to, and I, I wondered at first if, um, you know, how we should be thinking about this. But so, for example, I, I offer you one slide with some ideas of, you know, when all those other tactics don't pan out, you know, after we've looked at where the audience can be contributing through work, when we look at what kind of support comes from the host university, um, when all of those other sources have been tapped, if there still is an area where we need to invest more and we don't have a source, then some of these models are perfectly compatible. Um, so I'll just show you some of the examples. The Stanford Encyclopedia uh, of, uh, of Philosophy, open access since the start. It's all user, freely contributed user content, freely contributed user editing. They have a very modest budget. They've developed an endowment. Even beyond that, they realized they needed a little bit extra to fill in when their, the endowment wasn't going as well as they had hoped. And they came up with something extremely clever and extremely simple. They developed a new version. So instead of being able to just freely view the version online, we'll make it into a downloadable PDF in a format you like. And you know, its, it's deepest, most committed users stepped up and agreed to pay some nominal fee. It might have been $20. It wasn't, quite, wasn't too much. But they, were, they managed to cover about 10% of their annual operating costs just from that, that idea. So there are several ideas like this. There's a, a CD coming out of the Florida State Archives where, again, content is entirely open. There's the French Audiovisual Archive where, again, content is open and people can choose to make a customized CD or DVD and all sorts of things like that. So there are some ideas out there, but so long as we keep them in the right context, it's not necessarily the first thing anyone's going to do, but if it's something that's necessary, there are options. And the last piece is just thinking about what it means to organize the whole thing. You know, at what level does it need to be sustainable? An individual project might be the equivalent of a little bit of a loss leader, and another one might be driving tremendous traffic. And are there ways that the one that's driving tremendous traffic can somehow help to support the other one or fill out the fuller story for the impact of the work that the library is doing? And now we'll go back. So if we assume that open is really just the starting point, you know, the quest for impact should really not end there. Um, building audience is a vital, vital thing for many, many reasons. It's the thing that helps you to demonstrate impact for funders. It's the thing that helps when you go to the dean and provost to seek host support. And there are lots of ways that it's also useful to get um, support from users and all those various ways that they contribute. So by incentivizing them and doing things that, that they feel are useful to them, not because they feel an obligation, but because they feel a desire to support it. Um, you know, revenue models may be perfectly suitable to open content projects, 
so long as they are aligned with the needs and values of the audience. And I think that's, that's the, the takeaway there. Um, if it makes sense and it can be helpful, then it's, it might be worth experimentation. Finally, in a system where funding doesn't come easy and where we know that there are so many sources of competition for readers' attention, um, and there's very little support for ongoing development of this kind of original published content, um, you know, it may be worth using every trick in the book. Um, if there is impact and value, and if the audience recognizes it, someone somewhere thinks that it's useful, then sustainability will follow. Thank you. <laughs>